So welcome, everyone, to this Google Hangout in which we will discuss uh, the Arctic 30 with Kumi Naidu, uh, Executive Director of Greenpeace International, and Ben Aliff, the Director of the Greenpeace International um, Oil Program. Ben, is that actually your title? What is your actual title? Sorry, I'm having, it depends, it depends who you ask. Um, no, I'm head of our, our Arctic Oil Program. Perfect. So it was very nice to call me a director. Great. Um, if anyone else on the chat has questions they'd like to ask Kumi or Ben, you can use the chat box on the right, or if you're on Twitter, you can use hashtag Arctic30. You can also watch the entire broadcast after it's over on our YouTube channel. So before we get started, I'd like to ask Kumi just to give us uh, an overview of what is going on. It's been a very hectic uh, almost three weeks now, and so if you can just get us up to speed, that would be terrific. Thank you, Travis. Uh, hello, everybody. Firstly, why is the Arctic important for all of us all, all around the world? The Arctic serves as a refrigerator or air conditioner of the planet. What happens in the Arctic has an impact globally. Uh, it's related to, on the one hand, uh, glaciers melting in places like Greenland that's contributing to sea level rise, which is already having quite uh, devastating effects on small island states and on communities who live on the coast around the world. But more importantly, the Arctic sea ice serves as a refrigerator or air conditioner uh, turning away the harsh rays of the sun. And we are hitting now uh, critical moments where, for example, last year when we were taking exactly the same action that our colleagues uh, just took a couple of weeks ago uh, at that same rig, uh, we were there when the Arctic sea ice minimum level reached its lowest ever. Furthermore, we also know that uh, we've been told 20 years ago by the science that we should keep uh, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere to not less than 350 parts per million. And we now are seeing uh, this year, a couple of months ago, we have passed the 400 parts per million of carbon concentration in the atmosphere, which is, again, another sign uh, that we are running out of time. And to add to it, throughout the world now, we are seeing extreme weather events happening on a very, very, uh, with, with greater rapidity. All of these. Uh, suggest to us that it cannot be business as usual and we need to intensify our activism when uh, both the science uh, and Mother Nature herself is telling us that we are running out of time. The Arctic in particular is very fragile, very remote, and if there was a oil spill in the Arctic, it would be virtually impossible for us to safely clean it up. So it is for that reason Greenpeace, as part of its broader climate campaign, is focused on calling for the upper Arctic to be declared a sanctuary, similarly to how the Antarctic some decades ago was declared a uh, protected area where there's no industrial activities and it is uh, preserved for science and the protection of nature. That's what we're fighting for and we do so with the support of the indigenous peoples of all over the Arctic who have made a similar call and uh, and we have been taking various actions in the last two years. We succeeded in getting Kern Energy out of uh, Greenland where we did multiple actions over a two-year period. Uh, we uh, last year, I like to think, contributed to Shell and its fiasco in the Alaskan Arctic by uh, Shell having wasted five billion dollars of their investors money where having to uh, abandon for now anyway the designs on the Alaskan Arctic. However, the, the rig in question, the Gazprom operated uh, rig in the Russian Arctic in the Barren Sea, is in fact the first uh, operation in the upper Arctic that will actually start uh, drilling for oil. We still, we have lots of exploratory projects going on and this is one of the most, uh, and, and we want to draw a line in the ice and say, uh, it is so immoral that, in fact, the very reason we can even consider drilling in the Arctic is because of the burning of oil, coal, and gas. And the very same companies that got us in the mess are now saying, well, let's go and see what we can exploit from there. So with gas from last year, we did exactly the same action. And we, the Russian Coast Guard was there. They didn't intervene. They noticed that we were peaceful with the same ship, the Arctic Sunrise. And after a week of protest, we left and continued with our mission.
This year, there's been a very different uh, approach, and I'll hand it over to my colleague, Ben Aleph, to update you on where things land, uh, stand with regard to the current protests. Over to you, Ben. Thanks, Kumi. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, so as, as Kumi was saying, we were we were up in uh, the Russian Arctic uh, a couple of weeks ago with uh, with our ship, the Arctic Sunrise, and we were there to um, basically shine a light on what this company, Gazprom, were doing. Um, their platform in in the in the Arctic will be the first ever platform anywhere on the planet that will start producing commercial oil that will end up in the in the petrol tanks and gas tanks of cars around the world from the icy waters of the Arctic. And this thing is going to be starting doing that within the next couple of weeks, possibly months. So there was a very, very clear sense of urgency for us to act. And what we were seeing was as the as the ice in the Arctic reaches its summer minimum, um, that these companies uh, were using this, uh, the, the plight of the vanishing Arctic ice as an excuse to go further and further north into more fragile and remote waters to drill for more of the oil that's causing the place to melt in the first place. And this is clearly a vicious circle that needs to be broken. So a couple of weeks ago, the Arctic Sunrise uh, went to the platform, and we had two of our climbers on board. With a, um, they were going to put a banner on the side of the, the platform to bring global attention to what was happening there. Then the Russian Coast Guard intervened. Um, they arrested two of our climbers, um, Sini and Marco, with a very, very aggressive response. It was um, something that I've not witnessed for, uh, for uh, all of my time at Greenpeace. There were guns used, knives used, um, excessive force. And then the following day, the Russian security services stormed the Arctic Sunrise itself, our ship. At gunpoint, they held uh, the 28 members of the crew still on board and then seized control of the ship illegally in international waters. They then sailed it to the nearby port of Murmansk where all our people are currently being held and yesterday we found that they're being charged with piracy uh, which is an exceptionally serious uh, charge looking at up to 15 years imprisonment and really they're there because they took action um, to try and bring global attention to the plight of the Arctic. It is the face if you like of, of global ch climate change. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as any other region on the planet. The ice is in free fall and we have to stop because company, we have to get companies like Gazprom to stop because they see it as a business model and a business opportunity rather than a stark warning that we need to take positive action. So that's why we were there and uh, our people are still in jail and we need everyone's help to try and get them out as quickly as we possibly can. Travis, over to you, sorry. That's fine. Thank you very much for that uh, update. So you're welcome to ask questions if you're in, in the Hangout in the chat box to the right or also in uh, on Twitter. OK, I'm sorry. The chat box is disabled. So if you'd like to ask questions, your best bet is the free, uh, sorry, the hashtag Arctic30 on Twitter. That's OK. So the first question that we have actually that came through um, from Julianne Hall. Um, so I think this is probably a question for Ben, but possibly for Kumi as well. As, uh, Julianne asks, the Russian oil rig in the Arctic, by what authority does Russia have to be drilling for oil? How does Putin state that they aren't pirates and then charge them for piracy? So the question is, what authority does Russia have if this is actually international waters? That's a very, very uh, interesting question, Julianne. So as you say, the um, w well, what, what's basically happening is that the, the platform is drilling in what's known as the EEZ, the Exclusive Economic Zone of Russia, which is a stretch of water which exists between 12 miles and 200 nautical miles off the Russian coast. So that's international waters in the sense that, that vessels and ships have the right to passage and go through it but the, the Russian authorities have uh, exclusive access rights to the oil, the minerals, the gas, the fishes, and stuff like that, that that are found there. So we were seized in international waters, our ship was seized in international waters for taking peaceful action against this platform, which also sat in international waters. And what we're seeing now is that the Russian authorities are saying, um, we brought you to Russia, uh, we're going to charge you in Russia, we think the platform was part of Russia, and so you're going to have to to like it, I'm afraid. And we would argue that under international law, that is absolutely wrong. Uh, we were seized illegally in international waters. You can't 
go around just grabbing people and taking control of their ships. Um, there are very, very clear guidelines about what you can and can't do on the high seas. And to suggest that we were somehow pirates when we were clearly taking part in a, in a peaceful protest um, is absurd. So that will really form uh, the basis for a lot of the, the legal defense that we're putting in place. But it basically comes down to the fact that the Russians, um, through force of arms, seized our ship, brought them back to Russia, and have basically kept them there and are now trying to, to force Russian law on them, even though the, uh, the peaceful protest took place in international waters. Terrific. Thank you, Ben. If you're just joining us, you're joining us late. We're discussing the 28 peaceful activists, freelance photographer, and a freelance videographer who are potentially facing 15 years in Russian prison for um, charges of piracy, uh, which were uh, given to these uh, Arctic 30 after an act of peaceful protest in the Russian Arctic. So uh, another question that's come through uh, from hashtag free the Arctic 30 or hashtag Arctic 30 is what has the media coverage been like in Russia? We've seen what it's been like in, uh, in the United States for us, in the UK, uh, also in Amsterdam, but I'm wondering if you have a sense of what Russian media have thought of this. Do you want me to answer that, Travis? Sorry. If you know, or Kumi, yeah, if you I, I mean, I can have a go. It, I mean, it's obviously Russia is um, a very, very different place from, from Western Europe or, or North America or, or anywhere else, really. Um, they have, the state-run media there has, has really gone into overdrive against the, the actions that, that Greenpeace took. Um, by and large, in, this, in the state-controlled media, the tone has been that what we did was an act of piracy. It was... Uh, an overt piece of aggression by a, a foreign agent aimed at destabilizing Russia. There's also been talk of, you know, we're doing this at the behest of Western oil companies to, to somehow undermine Gazprom and the Russian economy. Um, but that said, there are, elsewhere within the Russian media, um, there are uh, voices who are sort of fighting against that tide, if you like, and there have been some very encouraging uh, pieces by some quite senior lawyers, for instance, in Russia who've said that the charges of piracy are absurd, you know, it's making Russia look stupid in, in the eyes of the international world bringing these charges. Um, so there are voices out there, but, but by and large the, the, the media response has been um, quite strong. And, and I should just say that the work that our colleagues in Russia, in Moscow and Mamans have been doing to try, and, to try and push back against some of this negativity has been really, really inspiring to see. Uh, if I can just add to that, Travis, <clears throat> the irony here is that uh, not only is a lot of the media, state-owned media in Russia, but actually Gazprom itself is such a major uh, economic player that they themselves are the owners of quite significant amounts of um, uh, media capacity. So there has been quite a negative reaction uh, and and uh, by most of the state-friendly and Gazprom-friendly media. Uh, there is a s smaller component of the media that is progressive and is a bit more independent. And uh, they, for example, responded on Friday last week to the arrest of the Russian photographer who said in court, the only crime, the crime that I am being charged with this called journalism and I will continue to do it. So he was there, you know, to document what is happening and so on. <clears throat> and so Friday last week in Solidarity, all the online independent media blacked out their photographs. They didn't carry photographs at all uh, as a sign of solidarity. So I would say that uh, the cards are stacked against us in terms of reaching the Russian people with uh, explaining the logic of what we did, why we did it, why it impacts on the Russian people as much as it does on people all over the world and so on. But I think even within the small uh, space that we have, we are trying to be as creative and innovative as possible to try to ensure that we are able to engage with the Russian people so that they understand that this action was as much in the interest of the Russian people as it is of people all over the world because we have to realize that the climate crisis does not recognize any borders, that in fact 
at the end of the day, we either get this right as rich and poor countries coming together and addressing climate change collectively and we secure the future of all our children and their children, or if we get it wrong, yes, some countries will be impacted first, but ultimately we all will uh, suffer quite uh, devastating consequences. Thank you. Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you, Kumi. I think that one of the things it brings up for a number of the people who are seeing it in the media is what cause would you risk life and limb for, or would you risk spending 15 years in a Russian prison for? Um, and it really uh, makes us admire the activists who have done this work and the people on the ship quite a bit. And you yourself took an action against this against this rig last year. And I, I wonder if you'd be able to describe a little bit, since we can't talk to the activists right now, if you'd be able to describe a little bit of what it was like for you to climb on this rig a year ago in the Russian Arctic. Okay, the truth was I was shit scared. Uh, <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not a good swimmer, and I'm not a very, uh, I did one day crash course on climbing in the Cape Town Rock Center and then practice every day while we were sailing from Norway to to the Barren Sea. And uh, just to describe how we do it and, and, and why, in fact, the charges of piracy are just so uh, disproportionate and uh, really unrealistic, because we keep the ship outside of what the Russian government calls an exclusion zone around the rig of 500 meters. We enter the exclusion zone in the inflatable boats to go and put up the posters and get the message out. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we um, would do, once the inflatable is on the way to the rig, the captain of the Greenpeace ship will radio the captain of the rig and say, we are Greenpeace, we're a peaceful organization, we are here to engage in an act of peaceful protest, uh, there is no danger to property or people, and and we establish contact immediately. You know, just as the uh, so so. There's never any ambiguity about who we are and what we are there, and we'll say to them what the purpose of the mission is and so on. So last year we took quite a lot of uh, beating from the from the Gazprom security crew because we did manage to get up on two little uh, tents on the outside of the rig. Just to be clear, we, didn't, we don't get into the rig. We actually occupy and hang the banners on the outside of the rig. And we managed to get up, and then we had uh, many, many hours of being uh, blasted with a water cannon uh, heavy hose. Uh, we managed to survive for the whole thing for close to 20 hours, and then eventually the little tents that we were on were broken by the force of the of the water hoses and 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 you know eventually our captain negotiated with the captain of the rig to stop the the water hoses and to let us come down we we we, we got down we got back to the ship uh, we recuperated over the weekend and then on the monday we were back there uh, again, I was part of that action. We attached ourselves on the anchor of the supply ship and essentially succeeded in uh, stopping their activities for about a week. And we were happy even before we left. Uh, before we left, uh, um, uh, sorry, before we left um, the area to head back to Norway, uh, Gazprom actually announced that they were suspending operations. Uh, you know, for that season, for that season before the ice uh, froze again and, and, and we entered the, the, the winter months. So while we were there, we, uh, uh, on the outside of the rig, uh, we did, uh, we had a satellite phone, we did interviews with media, uh, we, and, and, and essentially this uh, tradition of activism uh, draws from the Quaker movement, uh, this notion of bearing witness. What we feel is many of the companies that have engaged in environmental crime, not just now but historically, have got away literally with murder because they happen in very remote places that are outside of the visibility of the vast majority of people on our planet. And this particular facility, which only exists because of the burning of oil, coal and gas over the last century and more, is out of sight 
of even most of the Russian people don't know where this uh, rig is and, and so on. So part of what we were doing was to draw global attention and, uh, and I think both last year and this year we have succeeded in getting a global conversation going about the need to declare the upper Arctic a global sanctuary for us not to have industrial drilling and commercial fishing in the Arctic generally and for us to recognize that protecting the Arctic and saving the Arctic is about saving the planet and, uh, and, and, and giving us a chance to avert catastrophic climate change. Great, thank you. And it is the, f the first offshore oil rig that would be operational in the Arctic, correct? Correct. Right. So uh, we, have, we have other questions coming in from the Free the Arctic 30 hashtag on Twitter. Uh, if you're joining late, we're discussing the 28 activists and two independent journalists who are being held uh, by Russian authorities and have been charged with piracy for their, for their peaceful activism in the Russian Arctic. Uh, one question that we had. Uh, yeah. Travis, sorry, mm -hmm. there's just some fresh news that's just come in on BBC. Shall I just share it with the. Please, with the yes. So the Greenpeace ship uh, is registered in Holland, which means that it sails uh, under a Dutch flag. And um, maybe I'll just read this uh, brief news item that's just uh, come out. Uh, the Dutch government takes legal action over Greenpeace ship in Russia. The Netherlands has launched legal action after Russia charged 30 Greenpeace actors with piracy. Uh, the Foreign Minister Franz Timmermans announced he was acting to free the Greenpeace ship Arctic Sunrise. He said he was also taking diplomatic steps to secure the release of the activists. Um, the Netherlands, as the state under whose the flag the Arctic Sunrise sails, Today started an arbitration process on the basis of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea against what it sees as unlawful detention of the ship and to have it released and its crew freed. The foreign minister said in a letter to Parliament, to the Dutch Parliament today. The ne Netherlands is the first country to take legal action in the case. Um, so that's I thought I'd share this with the Google Hangout uh, views and listeners because this is sort of breaking news, but also it shows that we are also opening up a, you know, you're seeing now uh, the outrage coming not just from Greenpeace, but it's coming from uh, reasonable observers of what has happened, and we welcome very strongly the Dutch government's uh, independent action on behalf of our activists and uh, and uh, Arctic Sunrise. Well, it leads very nicely into one of the questions that has come through from hashtag Free the Arctic 30, which is which world leaders have spoken out uh, against this and have, have pledged support, and which countries ha have you felt have been leading um, in, in the support actions? Well, uh, Ben, I'll start and then you can compensate my answer, please. Uh, so um, I think right now, uh, it's a very interesting moment that this is happening because Russia actually uh, as a country was uh, occupying a particularly high profile and positive profile in the global diplomatic space after its intervention with regard to the chemical weapons issue in uh, Syria. Uh, now, as far as I know, no sitting head of state has actually uh, made a public uh, intervention. There have been several private behind-the-scenes uh, conversations that have happened uh, and it's best if we respect the confidentiality of those uh, governments who uh, engaged and, and we don't know for sure all of which has happened. Uh, what I must say has been positive is that every country with every of its citizens that are affected who make up the Arctic 30. They have had consular representatives in Murmansk, they met with their citizens and they are all heavily engaged. So all the countries of where the activists come from, their governments have been very positive in their response and obviously trying the best to secure uh, a fair process uh, for their citizens in uh, the Russian courts. Um, 
we have got uh, you know various uh, uh, high profile people have actually uh, made statements of support uh, but I, I as far as I know no sitting head of state has made a call yet on uh, the authorities in Russia to release uh, the activists. It doesn't mean that they are not following it, that they are not concerned, and that have, they have not uh, intervened behind the scenes. Thank you. Uh, ben, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, just to say that, 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 that I think you're absolutely right, Kumi, the, the, that there has been a, certainly a lot of work going on behind the scenes with both the offices of, uh, sorry, the, the countries of, of detainees themselves, but also influential countries with Russia to make sure that, that our people's fundamental human rights are being uh, observed whilst they're being detained, but also that they start, countries start putting out um, behind the scenes work really to sort of um, explain to Russia that, that there is a problem here and that the way our people are being held is against international law. But given the nature of, of Russia and the, the reaction to outside interference often within Russia, we have to be very, very delicate with that. So we know that there is an awful lot of work going on in, in uh, the foreign offices and foreign ministries around the world, which is really great to see. Great, thank you. Uh, again, if you're just joining us, we're talking about the Arctic 30, uh, 28 activists uh, and crew members from Greenpeace who are detained in Russia right now and have been charged uh, in this past week with piracy and we have two independent journalists as well who are who are in that 30. Uh, one of the questions that's come through over Twitter in the free the Arctic 30 hashtag uh, which you're welcome to ask further questions at hashtag free the Arctic 30 or hashtag Arctic 30 questions for Kumi Naidu, Executive Director of Greenpeace International or Ben Aleph, Head of the Arctic Oil Program here at Greenpeace. One of these questions has come through is many say that you should have stayed out of Russia and that you went too far this time. Is Greenpeace too extreme? Um, and I think I'll kick that over to Kumi first and then, and then Ben. Whether an act of peaceful resistance is extreme or not must be judged in the light of the scale of the threat and danger that humanity faces as a result of us engaging continuously in actions against the advice of science um, and the scientific community to drive our planet closer and closer to catastrophic climate change. Already uh, we are losing close to 500,000 people primarily in the developing world who die as a result of impacts, climate impacts that we are feeling already. We need to understand, particularly for people in the developing world, who, by the way, carry the least responsible for responsibility for carbon emissions. These are people, in fact, who don't drive cars often, uh, not living with all the modern uh, electronic appliances, which contribute to emissions and so on, but they are paying the first and most brutal price. So when you judge an action that we took, which was a peaceful action, which we took exactly, by the way, exactly the same action last year. And last year, the Russian Coast Guard was there. They observed. They were, by the way, uh, put under a lot of pressure by the Gazprom officials on the rig to intervene. And they, because you can hear everything that is being said, because once you're in that part of the world, you rely on radio uh, signals and channels for communication so we can they can listen to us and we can listen to them. And there was some very interesting abusive conversations between the captain of the Gazprom rig berating the captain of the Coast Guard rig, asking them to intervene and arrest us and so on. And uh, the captain of the Coast Guard rig basically said the directions we got from Moscow is to observe and if they're peaceful not to intervene. And we continued for five days in their presence. Uh, and, and, and left peacefully at the end of the various protests we did. And there was no response at all, absolutely no response. It wasn't as if we hid it. We put it on YouTube. You can even go now and you can see the actions from last year. So, uh, so is it extreme? I think absolutely not. What is extreme <laughs> and what is the worst act of extremism is that when the science 
tells us clearly when the World Bank, when the United Nations, when uh, the International Energy Agency, when Price Waterhouse Coopers, the corporate uh, entity, all of these agencies over the last 12 months have been saying we are running out of time and we are pushing the planet towards the brink because we continue to burn uh, coal, oil and gas and contribute further to emissions, that's what is extreme. What is extreme here is people who are willing to sacrifice the future of our children and grandchildren in the interests of profit and to, in the process, potentially take us to the bridge of, uh, to the cliff of uh, climate catastrophe and threaten life on this planet as we know it. That is what is extreme. People have to judge whether, in fact, our actions, given the scale of the threat, the scale of the problem, was um, disproportionate. I would argue it certainly wasn't, and, 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 and it was no different from what we did last year. So if last year the Russian authorities uh, were willing you know, to observe and, and, and acknowledge it as a peaceful, uh, non-violent environmental protest, we can't understand why in 12 years there'd be such an extreme, uh, 12 months, I beg your pardon, there would be such an extreme uh, shift. But let me just conclude by saying that, you know, history has shown us that when humanity has faced a major injustice or a major challenge from slavery, colonialism, women's right to vote, uh, civil rights in the United States, um, you know, uh, colonialism, apartheid, and so on, these struggles only move forward when decent men and women were, stood up and said enough is enough and no more, we prepare to go to prison if necessary, we put it, prepare to put our lives on the line if necessary, and we are prepared to break unjust laws if necessary. And let's ask ourselves who are the laws protecting right now? The laws are protecting the leadership uh, of the fossil fuel industry way above a balance of uh, protecting uh, the interests of people and the interests of the planet that people need to actually survive on. So in that sense, I would quite strongly say that I do not believe that our action was uh, at all extreme or disproportionate. What I would say, rather, is that the response to our action was exceptionally uh, disproportionate and was uh, was was completely unjustified, especially the firing of bullets uh, uh, at our colleagues who were in inflatable boats, uh, the way they came on the helicopter and occupied the ship and so on in international waters, which we consider an illegal act anyway. Um, and, and I think though that is what was extreme, not our actions. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, ben, I have a separate question for you. Uh, for those of you who are just joining, we're talking about the Arctic 30, the 28 activists and crew on the Greenpeace Arctic Sunrise who have been detained in Russia and charged with piracy along with two independent journalists. And we have Kumi Naidu, who is the executive director of Greenpeace International, and Ben Aleph, who is in charge of the Arctic oil program with Greenpeace. Um, ben, I wanted to ask you if you think that this is more than just an environmental issue and if there's a wider, um, if there are wider politics at play. Well, I mean, I, I think first and foremost, it is um, an environmental issue of, of incredible importance to every man, woman, and child on the planet. What, what happens in the Arctic and the people that work there and operate there with these giant oil platforms is something that we all need to care about because it will have an impact on us. So there is a huge um, environmental um, onus for us to, to try and stop these companies. But I think there are a couple of other things at, at play here. First is the sort of the geopolitics of the North, if you like. Russia is um, certainly trying to flex its muscles in the Arctic. Um, it's very recently, you know, talking about putting army brigades, um, military ships, bases in the Arctic. It, it sees the Arctic as its own territory and its its own inalienable rights to, to work there and to drill for oil and gas and fish. And um, at the same time, there are other Arctic nations that are having similar views on their own patches of the Arctic. So what we're seeing is a, a grand geostrategic game in, in the far north um, with a lot of countries trying to 
try and keep out the rest of the world, the rest of humanity from, from having a role or a say in it. So it certainly touches on that. But I think the response from the Russian authorities also touches on the, the very, very important point of the role of peaceful protest. Our people um, went to the Arctic because they have a very strong personal belief that what's happening there is wrong and that we have a duty to stop environmental harm when we see it. The Russian authorities' response was uh, exceptionally overbearing. It was violent, um, disproportionate. We now have ludicrous charges of piracy. And that is a grave threat to the, the guiding principles that the Greenpeace have, uh, were founded upon. And I think it should be something that concerns us very all, uh, concerns all of us uh, to, a, to a, a significant amount when peaceful protest gets this response for taking action against something as vitally important as the Arctic. Terrific. Thank you, Ben. Uh, it's also true, right, that the, a few years ago the Russians did plant a flag, correct, at the bottom of the Arctic? Um, they did, yeah. They, they, they brought a, a submarine down um, to the about four kilometers under the North Pole and placed the Russian flag um, at the bottom of the sea there in, in, in waters which no one owns. So it's, it's, it was very much a statement of intent by the Russians that they see the Arctic and everything there as, as, as their own. Uh, Travis, can I just jump in to say that one of the dangers, uh, to put this in broader geopolitical terms, is that we are seeing the beginnings of a new Cold War over the Arctic. We are seeing territorial moves being made. Uh, what uh, President Putin did in Russia is not dissimilar to what Stephen Harper is doing in Canada through his now annual uh, trips to the Arctic, uh, uh, what they claim to be the Canadian Arctic. So, uh, and, and the US with Alaska and so on. And uh, various, uh, you know, Nordic countries also have, uh, you know, uh, claims. So, so right now, you know, rather than us be thinking about another conflict in this remote part of the world, which is critical for regulating the global climate system. Uh, this is a moment for humanity to come together and show the courage of saying this year is a global resource. We need to protect it and failure to protect it will drive us to climate destruction very, very fast and very, very quick. And uh, that is why Greenpeace is calling for the upper Arctic to be declared a global sanctuary exactly as the Antarctica uh, Antarctica has been protected and we believe that it's not a crazy uh, goal. Uh, bear in mind when Greenpeace and others started talking about a uh, sanctuary and a protected area in the Antarctic, many people said, ah, you never succeed, etc, etc. We did it in the Antarctic, we can do it with the Arctic, provided enough people in the world stand up now with us and say, enough is enough and our children's future and the, their children's future is much more important than the short-term um, indefensible humongous profits that drive the greed of the oil, coal and gas companies of the world. Thank you. I think that um, that points to one of the questions that we've been asked on uh, Twitter with the hashtag FreeTheArctic30. Um, that also points to the fact that this discussion is ongoing um, and that our supporters and also people who are interested in this case of 30 activist crew and independent journalists who have been detained in Russia and charged with piracy after an act of peaceful protest of how we can go forward. So the discussion on Twitter and also on Facebook and any in person uh, around the world is, gonna, is going to keep going. Um, because there are a number of people who are who are involved not only in in the jail cells and in our organization, but um, through Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and a number of other places. But someone did ask on Twitter how they can help, how they can help these activists, and also help what these activists were fighting for. So if if Kumi or Ben, you have any idea of how people who aren't working for Greenpeace aren't necessarily considering themselves environmental activists, how they can get involved and help. Uh, not only free the Arctic 30, but, but help the Arctic. 
I'll give it a shot and then Ben please uh, add to it. Uh, so the first thing that you can do is join our Global Day of Action tomorrow. Uh, we are having a Global Day of Action to, in solidarity with our colleagues that are in prison. Uh, perhaps uh, Ben, uh, you can just say how people can do that uh, if they want to find out the information. Secondly, I think you can write to your, uh, if you are in a country where there are citizens of your country that are in prison in particular, please write to your government and to your representative asking them to speak out publicly, calling for the release of our activists. Um, please uh, sign up to the Arctic uh, 30 Twitter uh, feed as well as Greenpeace uh, various accounts where uh, GP Sunrise I think is the other Twitter account uh, where you can be kept up to speed with things as they are happening. We have a team in Murmansk now of several lawyers and a small support team trying to take care packages like food and reading material and so on to our 30 colleagues that are in prison. And, and I think, you know, one way in which you can support our colleagues that are in prison is become an Arctic defender, uh, sign up to the Save the Arctic campaign and become part of this fight, which I would argue is one of the most defining uh, fights for environmental and social justice that is taking place in the world. It's a big fight, it's a difficult fight, it's going to be hard to win. But Greenpeace and other activists in the environmental and social movement have never been afraid of taking up big fights uh, that require treaties, that require you know big interventions and so on. And I um, very much hope that people will follow all the stuff on the Save the Arctic campaign, on the GP Sunrise, to the feed and so on, and um, and are able to uh, get it actively involved with us. Just yeah, just to add from to that, Kumi, um, the, if, if people are really looking to, to get involved in the Global Day of Action tomorrow, the place to go is, is Greenpeace.org. Um, you'll be able to find a, an interactive map with all of the the solidarity events. They're happening from. New Zealand to uh, to Washington to Dakar in Senegal and then even in Murmansk uh, up in Russia. So you'll be able to find out all the information uh, by going to greenpeace.org and just clicking through on the Global Day of Action. It's front and center on the web page. And please do join us if you possibly can. Terrific. Um, there are, as both Ben and Kumi have said, it's a Global Day of Solidarity tomorrow. And we're holding vigils all around the world in solidarity with the Arctic 30. And you can join a vigil somewhere near where you are, and you can find it through greenpeace.org. We've been here for the past hour discussing the Arctic 30, the situation in Russia in which 28 Greenpeace activists and crew have been detained and charged with piracy along with two independent journalists. Um, it's something that we're all obviously very concerned about here at Greenpeace. And Kumi Naidu, Executive Director of Greenpeace International, has taken the time to talk with us, as long, along with Ben Aleph, uh, the Arctic Oil lead here for Greenpeace. And um, you all have been wonderful in asking questions through Twitter on the hashtag FreeTheArctic30. I think that's all the time that we do have. If there's anything, we have, I think, maybe 90 seconds. If uh, Kumi or Ben, you want to close us out with anything that you'd like to say uh, about this situation that's ongoing. Like I say, this is they have, they've been charged with piracy, and that carries up to 15 years in jail, uh, in this Russian jail. And so it's it's very serious for these activists, but it's also incredibly serious for for our planet. Um, so Kumi or Ben, do you want to close us out here? Well, I, I can close you out on a, on a Mahatma Gandhi quotation. When Mahatma Gandhi once said, First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. So uh, they're not ignoring us, they're not laughing at us, they're fighting us really hard. And I hope that can only mean that we are one step towards winning a real deal to avert catastrophic climate change, save the Arctic, and most importantly, to get our colleagues freed as soon as possible so they can be reunited with their family and friends back in their homes as soon as possible.
Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ben and Kumi, and thank you all for joining us. Um, and we'll continue to work, and please, please join us through greenpeace.org and through hashtag freethearctic30. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.